1.30 on my screen. So welcome everyone to this session on an HSI approach to implementing an OER program. I have a quick statement to read on behalf of the OESS. The Open Education Southern Symposium strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment by being mindful of the space and the time you're taking up, being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, being considerate of others' desire for privacy, being respectful of others and accepting that differences in opinion and circumstances create a stronger collaborative environment and actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. Presenters, you can take it away. Great, thank you so much, Sean, and thank you to OESS for having us here today. My name is Elizabeth Dezuch. I'm the Information Literacy Librarian at Texas A&M International University. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm joined today by my colleague who can introduce themselves. Hello everyone, I'm Ben Rollins and I am the Library Director at Texas A&M International University. So our session today is about OER and how it has been implemented and used on our campus. TAMU is no stranger to OERs, but there hasn't really been a cohesive program that collates data or does outreach and marketing. So we've been filling in this void and collaborating with different uh, campus partners to implement a more cohesive OER program. A little bit of background about Texas A&M International. We are a part of the A&M system. We are under their umbrella. However, we are very different and unique from all the 10 other campuses that are uh, statewide in Texas. And Laredo specifically has a 30% poverty rate. The town is also 95% Hispanic and that impacts our enrollment, of course. So, a lot of our students are those first generation. They are 93 uh, or 94% Hispanic and our enrollment is about 6,600. Now our campus is a little bit older. It's not as old as some of the a and institutions. We turned 25 last year and our institution has been around for 50 years. They've been through some name changes and location changes. So our building that you can see in the picture is about 25 years old. Now Ben will talk about OER impact. Yeah, so um, OER has been prevalent on our campus for quite some time. Um, our faculty have been using OpenStax textbooks for at least um, probably four or five years, but there's never been a systematic way for us to um, gain insight into what the OER activities are on campus. So this past fall, what we decided to do um, was start tracking that information. Um, so for the fall, the spring, and the summer, um, we found that there have been 147 courses using OER, um, more than 6,100 students enrolled, um, which has led to over $640,000 in savings, um, 55 different faculty um, from 57 different disciplines. And then we also looked to see how this compared with um, the rest of our, our courses, what percentage of courses we're using OER, and we calculated that to be about 6.4%. So what we did is we took all of that data and we created a website and a database with that website to track that information. So you'll see a screenshot of that off to the right, um, and as, as well as the link. So on that website too, um, you can see a full listing of each course that is using OER. We have a a listing of the OER that has been adopted. We've built in a search functionality to that site as well that will search 150 different OER resources. Um, and we have also created a section for students as well. So students can come to the site and actually search for their courses that are using OER. Um, so Elizabeth, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So we have come across some barriers with this implementation. So we've had a lot of meetings with our, our faculty and our administration and we're pushing one way. And recently we found out that the institution has entered into agreement with Follett. Um, so they have decided to do a one-year pilot program to provide course materials to all students um, for free using the CARES funding. So 
faculty are even being told that OER adoptions are required to go through Follett. Um, this was done at the end of the semester. So um, with the intention of it being rolled out in the fall, so there's still a lot of confusion among faculty and students um, about how this program is actually going to work. Now the pilot is just for one year and there's already been discussions of if we, if the institution plans to continue this pilot program, how, what would be the best way to go about that. And so they're talking about passing that on as a student fee after the pilot of $35 a credit hour. Um, we have been in a few conversations um, to raise our objection to this, that we were not involved with any of the, the decision making or any, any of the, the groundwork to this. We were essentially found out after, after the decision had been made. So that's a huge barrier for us as we're starting to really ramp up this program going into the fall. Um, but we know that long term that, that we're going to probably be asked to do a lot more as it centers around OER. Um, another barrier that we have is our current support structure. Right now, although there's some awareness across campus about OER, the library is the only one that is actively involved in supporting OER. Um, and this is new for us as, as well. So we've created an OER team so that that doesn't get dispersed just to one person, but there is a varying level of knowledge um, amongst our team within the library. So we do need more training even amongst our own OER team within the library. Elizabeth, will you go to the next slide? So we, there are some significant opportunities that we've come across over the last year, a lot of partnerships and collaborations that we've had um, and discussions that we've had with a variety of different groups on campus. Um, one is our university college, which teaches all incoming freshmen. Um, so we recently did um, a presentation and training for them around OER um, in May, because in the, they're redesigning their curriculum and their dean wants their signature courses all to utilize OER. Um, we've had conversations with our history departments around the adoption of new textbooks, um, and they have decided in the fall and the spring that um, their US history survey courses are all going to be using OER. So we know that that is going to be at least, I think 30 to 35 new sections each semester um, in history that we'll be using an OER textbook. Um, and then the Student Government Association has actually reached out to us about OER. Um, they had been talking to, I think, a faculty member and the faculty told them to come and talk to the library. So Elizabeth will mention this, I think, a little bit later, but we actually did a promotional video um, with the Student Government Association. Another opportunity we have is funding. Um, we have applied for an IMLS grant to fund an OER program. Um, we've also talked to sponsored research who has reached out to us several times and asked us for um, one to two page write-ups so that they can include in larger institutional grants to support OER. Um, so we, we have been involved in a lot of funding discussions with not just within the library, but looking for a variety of different grant opportunities. We've also had some faculty approach us about publishing OER after some of our conversations with them. We've had faculty from the College of Education approach us, University College, um, and political science who have expressed interest in publishing OER. So our plan as we're implementing this program is to continue to raise awareness um, and then get past like the awareness and the adoption to getting into the creation and adaptation um, of new and existing OER. And we just had a question in the chat, so I just wanted to follow up. So in case anyone else was wondering what Follett was, Follett is a textbook publishing and distribution company. And we were a Barnes and Noble um, bookstore, I think, when I started here in January, 2019, but I think we changed to Follett in the fall of 2019. Uh, so that's in case you're wondering what the Follett agreement was. So best practices. Um, these are just our suggestions, tips and tricks and things that we've learned. And we've started with identifying how our library can position and support OER. You need to look at your personnel and your resources and know how you can support OER 
We previously did not have an OER committee. So with Ben's help, we created an OER committee that would meet regularly, uh, develop our website, uh, begin communicating with the library liaisons and other departments and get behind OER in that way. So you wanna not bite off more than you can chew and definitely look and see what's manageable for your library or institution. And also through that, you can get a sense of what's happening on campus, what's already been going on. Like we said in our situation, things were already happening on campus, but there wasn't a cohesive place where all of those things came together. So we're hoping to spearhead that and, and bring all of this data together, bring all these people together. And so we can start having these conversations with one another and see this, this grow on our campus. So something to think about is it, it sounds really easy to reach out to other departments and faculty during whatever normal times are, right? People say, go to people's offices, engage in conversation, call them up, email them, um, go to departmental meetings. And a lot of people are still working virtually or half virtually or what have you. But all of all of this that we've done has been spearheaded during COVID. So if we can do it when a lot of things are done virtually and people are still distancing and that kind of thing, you can definitely do it too. It's definitely harder, I think, especially for those that really enjoy that that face to face communication. And I miss some of that, too. But there's definitely ways that that you can still reach out to other departments, talk to people, communicate, um, you know, word of mouth, get things, get things going on your campus. And one of those ways that you can do that is talk to your students and your student groups. And you can identify collaborators that way as well. So a lot of times we think of students as our population that we're creating services and resources and, and giving information to, but a lot of times they can help us get that information to their fellow students. And we've identified the Student Government Association as um, a potential partner and collaborator for us. And let me show you what that looks like. So this is a screenshot of an interview that they did. So they approached us actually, we were, we were kind of surprised because um, normally that doesn't happen. And they specifically wanted to talk about OER. And so we were like beyond the moon thrilled to do this with them. They made a series of videos introducing the students on campus to different uh, facilities, different services and departments. So for the library video that they did, they talked to the library director, Ben and myself about OER. There's their Instagram if you wanna go check it out and watch the video. And they actually came prepared. Um, they had some questions and it was done so professionally. Like we were just really impressed with the end product actual process and we are very much looking forward to working with them again. Um, so also we have a, we didn't have an OER committee. We also created an outreach and programming committee. So we didn't have a cohesive uh, group that did outreach and programming for the library. And we are using them to help us promote and reach out in different and new ways. And instead of just relying on the library liaisons, um, thinking outside of the box of ways that we can get um, information or tutorials or things like that out there. So I think um, now we'll have time for questions unless I missed anything and Ben wants to follow up. There's also our contact information there, our email addresses, our Twitter handles. And I see that we have some awesome questions and conversation going on in the chat. Yeah, we do have a question. Um, what do you talk to students and students a group about specifically? Um, well, what we talk to our, our Student Government Association about, and we've had this conversation on our library OER team, um, is how to best reach students. So we started with um, just asking them what they knew about OER um, to gauge what their awareness was. And then um, we went into kind of explaining what it is, what it entails, um, how it's beneficial for them, um, and then ask them ways in which we can engage more with, with students, what messaging would make the most sense to them, because different audiences, different messages um, are oftentimes needed. Like we'll talk to faculty about one thing, but we'll talk to students about it 
in a, in a different way because the impact is a little bit different. And also the library role in that. I think um, obviously a lot of students know, especially um, as they're more experienced in, the, in their college careers, what the library can provide. And so what our role in that is and how we are helping to assist and provide these, these resources. We also have our, um, uh, what is it called? The um, course reserves. And so kind of telling them it's like a complimentary service, kind of, sort of, not exactly, but um, how and why we're helping with that, I guess. I'm just looking at some more questions. So there's links here. We've also put a link to this presentation in the chat. So if you want to find any of these links that we've put in there, you're more than welcome to visit those. Yeah, I've seen some really interesting um, conversations in this conference about pedagogy and using the students to draft and create OERs for classes. And I think it would be great. We um, have an e-learning team with some instructional designers. So I think maybe in the future, um, a collaboration for us would be to reach out to the e-learning team and to start hosting maybe some informational uh, sessions for the faculty about what OER are, but also drafting them. But beyond just, of course, adopting and adapting OERs, um, putting them in their, their pedagogy and having students maybe draft some and create some for courses and We did have another question. Have we looked at D or uh, looked at evaluating OER based on a DEI lens? Yeah, when we've applied for funding through IMLS, um, part of our diversity plan was um, DEI was an extremely important piece of that for us. Um, we have a very diverse faculty at, at TAMU. Um, I think the, a survey from the Chronicle showed that we were in the top 10 of most diverse faculties um, in the country. So that that's very important for us when we look at um, the creation of OER to make sure that we have a variety of different voices um, that are going to be contributing in, in that manner. Um, and as Elizabeth mentioned, our, our long term plan is to get to that open pedagogy part to where students are not just the consumers of the content, but also the creators of the, of the course content too. And that's right. one opportunity. Sorry, Sean. No, no, go right ahead. I'm just going to say if there's any more questions or if you want to say anything else. So please go ahead. <laughs> I was just reflecting back on, uh, so one of our barriers was the follow agreement. But I also see that as an opportunity because in some of our um, Facebook groups with our, our TAMU student network and stuff, there's already been confusion about these, these agreements and the prices and what it looks like you know, on their, um, on their fees and stuff. So I think that's also an opportunity for us to maybe um, talk with them and bring it, bring up what OER are and, and that kind of thing. So I know a lot of campuses have some kind of similar agreements going on right now. So don't just be stuck with seeing this, these book agreements as a barrier, but they might be an opportunity as well. Yeah, and I think Spark actually has a, a listing um, on their website somewhere that shows all of the different types of agreements like um, like ours at different institutions as well if anyone's interested i can't remember the, the exact link right now um, but i will also say one last thing i want to say too is that we're anticipating for the this upcoming academic year that the oer usage on campus is going to be um, over 10 percent of all courses that are using oer so we're looking at potentially um, doubling what what we had last year um so that that's part of the the barrier with the the fallout agreement is we're feeling that it's in the short term it's kind of stunting some of that that growth that, that we were pushing toward um, but we do and some of the faculty that we've talked to they're still very much on board um, with continuing to adopt oer and have expressed interest in helping us get that message out even even more so um, in some ways 
Um, uh, thank you, Anita, for, for putting that there. Um, so. Right, any other questions before we close things out? I have a colleague who said it was always wise to wait 45 seconds of silence, but I can never bring myself to do that. Just don't have the willpower. Um, so unless there's any more questions, Huge thank you to both of our presenters, especially Ben, who managed to find a Wi-Fi spot in their car to come in and speak to us. So truly appreciate it. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all in the next session. Thank you all.